Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and it's time once again for your weekly wrap up and we're still making some tweaks to the format of the show. Your feedback has been appreciated. This week we're going to be talking about a major ISP and telco here in the U.S., which is about to go bankrupt, and whether or not wireline broadband is going to be the future of our internet connectivity. A really interesting topic to take a look at today, so let's get to it. Now, this week's wrap-up is being brought to you by our friends at Plex, and as many of you know, I've been using Plex to organize and manage my personal media for many, many years. I have most of my Blu-ray discs on my Plex server in the closet over there, many of my DVDs, including a lot of the kids' stuff that they like to watch over and over again. I've got music and TV shows in there, too, and I can pretty much watch whatever I want on any screen in the house just by loading up the Plex app. It is really versatile. And they've been getting into some other stuff lately, though, that makes it easier to start playing around with Plex if you don't want to set up a server. And all you have to do now is download a Plex app, sign up for a free account, and you can start streaming internet media to yourself for free, including podcasts. They have a great podcast client that uh, should get you most of your favorite podcasts delivered to your devices. And now they have free TV shows and movies from popular studios, including some exclusives, and those are free and advertiser supported. And you get all of this just by signing up for a free Plex account, no credit card required at the affiliate link that you see on screen. A great way to get into Plex if you're curious because you can start using the interface and getting a feel for how it all works and then you can install your own server a little bit later to begin organizing your personal stuff too. I want to thank Plex for their ongoing support of the channel. Now in the Facebook group last week, Travis Rhodes posted this article about how Frontier, which is a telephone company in 29 states and also an ISP in those states, might be filing for bankruptcy soon. Uh, this has long been rumored, but it looks like it is on the way to happening. Uh, as many people are cutting the cord for their TV services, they're also cutting the local phone cord, and they're also getting rid of Frontier as their video provider too. So they are really in dire straits here. And Frontier is a Connecticut-based company. They're actually based in the state in which I live. And I was very excited in 2014 when they announced that they were acquiring uh, all of the local phone assets here from AT&T. That includes their regular phone connections, the broadband connections, and the video operations. And I was excited because, first of all, these folks were based in Connecticut, uh, and they were making promises to really put in significant capital investments to expand the broadband network that AT&T had begun building out in other parts of the state. And Connecticut's kind of like a little microcosm for the U.S. as a whole. We do have some dense population centers, but we also have a lot of suburban and rural areas that are harder to reach and have less density. So it's very less profitable to bring fiber optic internet, for example, to where I live, where we've got big two-acre subdivisions and not a lot of customers for each mile of wire. But they had made that commitment to really do what AT&T wasn't doing. However, what Frontier was doing throughout this period of time was spending billions of borrowed dollars to acquire these landline assets all over the country. And as a result, they spent so much money acquiring this obsolete technology that they were not able to support it appropriately. In fact, on day one, when Frontier took over, uh, many AT&T customers saw their internet just black out, and it was a mess for weeks after that. Uh, my phone hasn't been working right for the last eight or ten months. I thought I was just getting a lot of robocalls, but as it turns out, my phone's been broken, and it's just not been working, and yet I'm paying $50 a month for it, so I'm going to be getting rid of that soon. And Frontier has been having a lot of problems <laughs> related to this because they're in debt, they're running off of obsolete technology that nobody wants anymore. Uh, so people are getting rid of their local phones and they're getting rid of their cable TV connections through Frontier. And you can see here their stock as of last week uh, closed at 55 cents down from uh, where it was about five years ago at about $118. So you can see the company here is just on its way to its demise. Now you might think, well, what about 5G? Isn't that going to save everybody? Well, not really. Uh, AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile, of course, are really talking about how fast and capable their 5G networks will be. But remember, 5G still requires a lot of infrastructure. In fact, it requires similar infrastructure to what you might need to bring fiber out to a neighborhood. 
you've got to have fiber optic cable running out to 5G cell towers. And if you're not able to bring those 5G fiber optic cables through every neighborhood in which those cell towers will be set up, you're right back where you started from and likely sticking with LTE. So if you've been sitting at home with lousy bandwidth like I am getting all excited about this 5G, I wouldn't get excited about it at all. And in fact, what's going to happen here is there's going to be multi-tiers of 5G. And this article from PC Mag last year was really eye-opening, especially as it relates to 5G in rural areas. Uh, because what rural areas are going to get uh, is something called low band 5G or sub 6, uh, which will not have the capacity, it won't have the bandwidth, uh, but you might still have the lower latency that uh, the 5G services are advertising. But for a lot of folks who are really struggling to get a good affordable connection, 5G is likely going to be just more of the same. But there's some interesting stuff happening, and you may not have been following what's been going on with SpaceX. So SpaceX, of course, has been launching rockets with satellites and uh, soon astronauts into orbit. But they have a tremendous market advantage for broadband internet. And the reason is, is that they can get stuff into space super cheap. They own the rockets. The rockets are reusable. And what they decided to do is take some of that uh, market advantage and turn it into a broadband service. And they're launching, literally, as we speak, uh, something called Starlink, uh, which is hoping to provide broadband internet service to every corner of the world using inexpensive low orbit satellites. And this is what it looks like. They're actually launching these things right now. There was a launch last week. There's been four launches so far. Uh, they stack 60 of these little satellites together and stick them on top of a used Falcon 9 rocket and push them out into orbit. Now SpaceX plans to launch thousands of these little Starlink satellites at an altitude of 340 miles. They want to have a constant moving constellation of these satellites continually orbiting the Earth. They can communicate with each other with light. They have lasers that communicate with each other and they communicate with radio waves down to the ground, uh, including your local antenna that you'll put up to communicate with the service along with their ground stations. And I would imagine as time goes on, you might see perhaps servers up there in orbit for Netflix and other stuff to uh, more quickly deliver media to customers on the ground. Now at this altitude, you do need more satellites because you are constantly moving, uh, but your light time is significantly reduced. So the light time by my calculations round trip is 0 0.0036 seconds from the ground to the satellite and back again. Compare that to a traditional communication satellite where you've got a single expensive satellite in very high geosynchronous orbit, uh, usually around 22,000 miles. You're looking at almost a quarter of a second round trip just in light time to get data back and forth to the satellite. Now we don't know much about the service offering yet. SpaceX hasn't talked much about that. But they did, in their FCC application, give some indicator as to what the capacity of the satellites are, at least currently. Uh, so they think they can get about 17 to 23 gigabits per second downstream in the aggregate from each individual satellite. Now that may not seem like much given that it's probably servicing a large area on the ground. But remember, with that many satellites in orbit, it's likely you're going to have more than just one in view of an area of customers at a time. So they might have two or three of these splitting that level of bandwidth at any given moment. Uh, they haven't, though, given any indication as to what the upstream will be. It will likely be much less because you do have to transmit up 340 miles to space. And I'm sure there are going to be some restrictions as to the power of the transmitters on the ground. Uh, but from my perspective, if it's anything more than the 12 megabits per second I'm getting from Comcast right now, I'm all in. Even if it's 100 or 150 bucks a month, just do it because I need that upstream speed and this seems like it might be at least a competitive solution to the local monopoly I have now. Uh, they say that they should be able to provide broadband service at speeds of up to one gigabit per second per end user. Uh, so this leads me to think that there will be likely more lower tier services that are more affordable versus the full gigabit, but that gigabit speed looks like it'll be something they plan to offer. 
Uh, latency will be about 25 to 35 milliseconds. That is a bit slower than what you might get on your cable system or through your uh, local fiber provider, but it's going to be better for a lot of folks in rural areas that are going to the geosynchronous satellite or dealing with some kind of cellular connection at lower speeds. So this is looking pretty good to me there. And they also talk about some of the ways they plan to manage capacity while in orbit. Uh, they're going to have some beam forming so that if there is a, a portion of the ground using more of the available bandwidth, they will direct uh, those antennas in that direction. And this is real. It's happening. I mean, this stuff is getting launched. They're trying to get something working by the end of the year, I think. Uh, their plan is to maybe start in the northern areas of the U.S., namely where I am. So that's why I'm so excited about this. And we'll have to see uh, how this develops as they get more satellites on orbit, because I'm guessing the more that are up there, uh, the better the individual experience will be for those on the ground. Uh, and again, we'll just have to wait and see exactly what they plan to offer. But there are some hints as to what the price might be. Uh, Gwen Shotwell, who's the uh, SpaceX president, who, by the way, does not get enough credit for the accomplishments of that company. Uh, Elon Musk, of course, is the CEO, and he comes up with a lot of crazy ideas that uh, Gwen here has to execute with her team. And I think it's a real indicator of just how talented she is and the team that she has put together uh, because what they have been doing at SpaceX has really transformed the aerospace industry in a very short period of time, and nobody saw this coming. Uh, so she deserves a lot of the credit for that. And in the interview with Space News, um, she talks about how millions of people in the U.S., myself included, pay $80 a month or more to get quote-unquote crappy service. Uh, she didn't say whether Starlink will cost more or less than $80 per month, but suggested that would be a segment of the public the company would target as well as rural areas that currently have no connectivity. SpaceX is investing $10 billion in this network, which is a lot of money, uh, but if you look at what $10 billion would get you on the ground, it's next to nothing as far as coverage is concerned. Uh, this $10 billion investment will cover the entire globe, and that is pretty significant from a cost standpoint. So I'm real eager to try this out. Uh, as soon as it's available, I will be buying it, and I will tell you all about it, and hopefully it will meet my minimal expectations, and I'm sure it might. So stay tuned, more to come on that. Now, I would love to know what you all think, because I know a lot of you are uh, in parts of the U.S. where you can't get good service. Are you excited about Starlink? Do you have your doubts? Uh, what do you think is going to happen? Will we all just be connecting to Elon Musk's satellites in the future, or is the rest of the industry going to step up and improve and bring down the cost so we can get better bandwidth around the country here? And I'm sure there are other parts of the world that will certainly benefit from this competition as well. Let me know what you think down below in the comment stream. Now, before we wrap up the wrap up, I want to thank our newest supporters here on the channel. They include Dennis Alvey and Nadim Sarwar, who contributed via the YouTube membership program. I want to thank you for your contributions. I also want to thank Clean937-Samuel, who made a super chat contribution on the live stream I did the other day. And if you want to contribute to the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support to contribute via our donor box page. We take Patreon, and we also, of course, take the YouTube memberships, uh, which gets you a nice little badge that will appear next to your name in chat and on comments. And I want to thank everyone who contributed this week, along with everyone who's been contributing on an ongoing basis, because all of those things equal channel growth. So let's take a look at what you might have missed this week on the channel. We first had my live stream as I was working on my mister yesterday. And the main component of the mister is a board that you can buy on Amazon for about 140 bucks. It's called the DE10 Nano. And in the live stream, we looked at some of the things you can run on the DE10 Nano by itself, because typically Mr. requires you to buy some memory and an I.O. board, but there are things you can do just by buying that initial piece to get started, and we looked at a few of those things uh, in that video, because what I was doing in the live stream was taking my Mr. and putting it into a case, and I had to take the whole thing apart to put it in the case, so I figured let's take a look and see what that DE10 Nano can do on its own. On the Extras channel, we unboxed a couple of things, including the Motorola One Action smartphone and another one of those Ryzen laptops that you'll be hearing about in a couple of days. Uh, on the main channel, we looked at a low-cost Oculus Quest PC link cable solution. Uh, we also had a very popular video this week on 
HEVC 4K transcoding with Plex and some of the things you need to think about if you want to watch your HEVC content off-site and transcoding it. Uh, we also took a look at the Unihertz Titan. Uh, the traffic on this video really surprised me because this is one of these niche smartphones. It looks like a huge BlackBerry, but it's running Android. And apparently there is an appetite for this phone out there. I got a lot more views on this phone than I expected. Uh, so you can check it out in the uh, video description down below for the master playlist for this and all of the videos that I just mentioned. So this week on the channel, we are going to be taking a look at low-cost Ryzen laptops. In fact, I think most of this week will be consumed uh, by the three laptops I picked up for this series. And the reason I'm doing this is that Amazon suddenly got a bunch of Ryzen 5 laptops from a bunch of different manufacturers all well under $500, and these laptops deliver a ton of performance for the low price point. But as you'll see, the three that we are looking at perform very differently from each other, so there's going to be some interesting things to see within each individual review. And then I'm also hoping to do another video about all the things you can do with a Ryzen chip and what kind of expectations you can have. So we cover gaming uh, throughout all three videos, but we're going to look at video editing with Adobe Premiere. We'll look at OBS and a few other things that uh, people might be asking about in regards to these Ryzen chips because they do deliver a lot of performance for a very low price. And all of these machines were actually really nicely equipped for the money. So this is going to be a fun little uh, project we'll be doing this week. And I've got a couple of live streams coming up this week. We have one on Tuesday, February 4th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time and a second one Wednesday, February 5th at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, those live streams will be appearing here, but they will also be on the front page of Amazon as well. We've been doing some live streaming with Amazon over the last couple of weeks. It's been a ton of fun. Uh, so you can find me there, or you can find me here, or in both places if you want. It's totally up to you. And if you want to know on YouTube when I pop on, uh, you can click on the notification bell, and that way you will be notified. Uh, whenever I do one of my random live streams. We have other places you can watch me on, including my Extras channel, my podcast, the Snippets channel, which has components of this show, along with my live stream archive, if you want to watch all the older live streams we've done. Uh, if you want to engage with the channel, you can sign up for my email list at lon.tv slash email. We have the Facebook page at lon.tv slash Facebook. Uh, we also have the Facebook group, which is just about to 900 members now, which is great. And I get a lot of great ideas for this show from there. And then we have my store where I sell previously used items uh, that are pretty much brand new and just a little bit used. And you got one shot at it because there's only one thing of inventory for each. And if you want to get notified whenever those items go live, you can sign up for my store alert email at lon.tv slash store alert. And that is going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. Let me know what you thought of the format this week. Again, I'm experimenting all month with different ways to make the wrap up more interesting and efficient. And what we're doing now is front loading the content at the beginning versus the middle. So I wanted to see how that works out. And then at the end of the month, I'll compile all the data and figure out uh, where the show goes on from here. Uh, we're going to have a Q&A episode next month incorporating your questions, so that is coming back. And we'll be, again, just experimenting to figure out what works best for viewers. And I really appreciate all the feedback that you've been providing me as we've been starting this experiment. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thank you all for watching. Thanks for the feedback. And I'm looking forward to having the Ryzen Laptop Week coming your way very shortly. Until then, it's Lon Seibin. Thanks again for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters, the Four Guys with Quarters podcast, Tom Albrecht. Rajesh, Logic GR, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more.
And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.